Hello, my name is Felipe Gavilán, and in this video, we are going to see an introduction to Entity Framework Core 7. We are going to see how to download it and install it. We are also going to see how to model a database from some c -sharp classes. Also, we are going to see how to read, update, insert, and delete data from a database using c -sharp code. And also, we are going to learn what transactions are, and in the end, we are going to publish our web API with Entity Framework Core to Azure to see how easy it is to have a database in Azure working with Entity Framework Core. For this video, I'm going to assume that you already have installed either Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. In my case, I will be using Visual Studio 2022. Also, I will be using SQL Server, though in your case, you could use either SQL Server local DB or whatever other database engine that is supported by Entity Framework Core. Finally, if you want a complete course where we will learn Entity Framework Core from scratch, please buy my Udemy course today. I will leave a link with a discount in the description of this video. Alright, so let's get started. Entity Framework Core is a library which we can use to access databases. In technical terms, Entity Framework Core is what is known as an ORM. ORM stands for Object Relational Mapper. An ORM basically allows us to represent the tables of a database in classes. That is, if we have a table of genres in a database, then in our c -sharp application, we can have a genre class. Then through our genre class, we can represent records from the genres table. Entity Framework Core is multi-platform. It can run on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Entity Framework Core can also work with different databases such as SQL Server, SQLite, PostgreSQL, MySQL, Oracle, among others. And while the main focus of this video is going to be SQL Server, the vast majority of the lessons we learn here can be used with Entity Framework Core for other database engines like Postgres. When should we use Entity Framework Core? These types of questions are very difficult to answer because each project has a unique context that makes it special, which means that it needs to be carefully examined to find out which tools are suitable for it. We typically use Entity Framework Core because it makes us more productive, that is, it allows us to develop applications more quickly. A speed is also a good factor, since with each new version of Entity Framework Core, it gets faster. The cross-platform support is also useful because you can write the code once and run it in different environments. The first reason not to use Entity Framework Core is if you must use a technology where Entity Framework Core is not supported. The second reason not to use Entity Framework Core is if it doesn't support the database you want to work with. Another reason may be, again, the issue of speed. Even if Entity Framework Core is very fast, it will never be faster than using pure queries, for example, with store procedures. Since Entity Framework Core represents an abstraction layer, which has a cost in terms of execution time. Finally, Entity Framework Core was not very good with bulk operations, but that has changed in Entity Framework Core 7, where we can easily and efficiently do bulk operations. Let's start by installing the Entity Framework Core GLI. With this tool, we can execute Entity Framework Core commands. It is recommended to install this tool because there are scenarios in which it is mandatory to have it such as when we deploy to Azure and we want to have the migrations to be applied in our Azure SQL database. We will see that at the end of this video. So let's install this tool. Let's go to Entity Framework Core Tools Reference .NET Core CLI and let's come down here and you are going to see that we have this command that we can use to install the Entity Framework Core CLI. Of course, you need to already have .NET 7 installed on your machine. So I'm going to assume that you already have .NET 7 and also that you have either Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code installed and also in our case an instance of SQL Server. So I copy this, I will open a terminal for that I can press 
window key R and in here I will write CMD and I will get this terminal and I will paste this code here. I can press enter and of course you're going to see that I already have the tool installed. But in your case, just to make sure that you have the latest version of the tool, you can come here and say .NET tool update. Let me copy this. Let me paste that here just so that we can update the tool. And you are going to see that in my case, now I have version 7.0.2. Excellent. Now let me close this and let's go to Visual Studio. Let's come here to create a new project. We will do this tutorial using Web API. We are going to use an SP.NET Core Web API template. Now, whatever we learn here in this video, you are going to be able to apply it into any kind of .NET project like a console application, WPF application, Blazor, MVC, etc. In our case, because it will be easy for me to show you many examples, I'm going to use a Web API template. So let me click on here and click on next. I'll say introduction to EF core ENG. Next, I'll use .NET 7. I'll use controllers. Please keep enable open API support checked and I will click on create. Let's configure entity framework core in our application. For that, we have to install two Nugget packages. So let's go to the solution explorer. Let me right click on the project, manage Nugget packages. Let's go to browse. And the first package that we have to install is the package for SQL Server. So as you can see here, we have Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server. As I said at the beginning of this video, we can use Entity Framework Core for many different database engines. For example, if I wanted to, I can say here EF Core, I can say here Entity Framework Core, and I can look for this one that says Entity Framework Core dot Postgres. As you can see, we also have packages for Postgres. In our case, we don't want to use Postgres, but I'm just showing you that you can definitely use different versions of the Entity Framework Core package that allows you to work with different database engines. But again, we're going to use SQL Server. So let me put this again here, Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server, and let me install this package. Let me click on Accept. Great. Now I have to install a second package. This package depends on what tool you are using. In my case, since I am using Visual Studio, I have to install Microsoft Entity Framework Core tools. Again, this is only for Visual Studio. If you are using Visual Studio Code or whatever other IDE or text editor, instead of installing this package, you have to install another one that is Entity Framework Core dot design, this one, Microsoft Entity Framework Core design. This is if you are using Visual Studio Code or another tool. In my case, since I am using Visual Studio, I have to install Microsoft Entity Framework Core tools. So that is the one that I'm going to install. Let me click on accept. After that, we are going to create a DB context. The DB context is the central piece of Entity Framework Core. This is where we configure everything. For example, that is where we are going to configure the tables that we are going to create from certain classes. So let's do that. Let me close this. Let me create that DB context class. Add class, let me say application DB context. This class is going to inherit from DB context, control dot, to bring the Microsoft Entity Framework Core namespace, control dot again, because I want to generate this constructor that has DB context options. We are going to learn what that is in just a moment. For now, I just want you to see that this is the class that I like to call the DB context. And this is where we are going to put the main configuration of Entity Framework Core. What tables we are going to create in our database, what is the configuration that those tables are going to have, etc. Now, as you can see here, there is nothing that says that we're going to use SQL Server. We don't even have a connection string here. That is what this DB context options is all about. The idea of this DB context options is that it is going to contain those kind of configurations. So what we're going to do is that we are going to go to the program class because it is from here that we're going to configure Entity Framework Core. It is from here that we are going to say that Entity Framework Core is going to connect to a SQL Server database. So let me say here, builder services at db context 
I'm going to pass here my application DB context class that we just created. Options, and I'm going to say options use SQL Server. Here I am saying that we're going to be using SQL Server. Now, all that we're missing is to pass a connection string. A connection string is a string that has the details of how to connect to our database. So what we're going to do is that we're going to go to the Solution Explorer. Let's go to here to upset in the development.json. And I want to say here, connection strings. Make sure that you write it correctly. Otherwise you're going to get errors when you execute the application. So let me say default connection here. And in here I will put my connection string. A connection string can have several values. One of them is server, which is the server in which your SQL Server instance is located. In my case, my SQL Server instance has the same name as my computer. So that is why I can say dot here. But if that is not the case for you, you can always open SQL Server Management Studio. And in here you are going to get server name and this is the name of my server. So I could copy this and I can come here and I can paste that here if I want to. But again, in my case, that is not necessary because the name of my machine coincides with the name of my SQL Server instance. So I can just write dot here and I'm good to go. After that, I need to say what is the name of the database that I'm going to use. In my case, it is going to be EF Core, or should I say introduction to EF Core ENG DB. Semicolon here. Integrated security. How are we going to log in to our SQL Server instance? Well, for this, I'll say true because I want to use my Windows credentials to log in to SQL Server. If in your case you want to use SQL authentication, then you have to put here the username and password. Finally, I have to say trust server certificate. This is because we are in a development environment and I want to relax whatever security rules exist for our application. This is not going to be used in production. This is only for development. This is the development file, which means that in production, you are not going to be doing this. In production, you are going to have a real certificate in your database server. So this is good enough. Now I have to copy this default connection and I have to come to the program class. And in here I will say name the name of the connection string that I want to pass to Entity Framework Core is going to be default connection. And let me put this in another line so that you can visualize everything better. And with this, we have configured Entity Framework Core. Now let's create our first entity. We call an entity a class that represents a table in our database. Since our project is going to be about movies, we are going to be creating entities related to this concept such as genres, actors, movies, among others. We will begin modeling our database with the genre entity. So let me create here a folder, at folder, I'll call it entities. This is where our entities will be located. Right click, at class, genre. And in here, we're only going to have two properties. The first one is going to be ID, and it is going to be of type int. And the second one is going to be name, the name of the genre, such as action, drama, comedy, and so on. Right now, this is just a simple class. This is not an entity. In order to make it an entity, we have to go back to the application DB context and we have to come here and we have to put a property, a DB set property of type genre. And the name of the property is going to be genres. And let me click here, control dot, to bring the namespace of entities. And now genre is an entity because here we are configuring that we're going to create a new table in our database using the genre class as its model, which means that we're going to have two columns, an ID column and a name column. And the name of this table is going to be genres. Why? Well, because here we said genres, although there are other ways to configure the name of the table. A really simple way of doing this is just putting here the name of the table that you want in your database. 
We are now going to generate our database with the genres table. For that we need to create a migration. A migration allows us to express in code the changes that are going to be made in our database. Migrations are classes that will be created when we run a command. Then the migration will serve as a history of the changes that our database has undergone over time. Let's create our first migration. By the way, the commands in Visual Studio and Entity Framework Core CLI are different. So for those of you who are following this tutorial using Visual Studio Code, I'm going to write on a pop-up the equivalent command for Entity Framework Core CLI. So let's go to the Package Manager console, and if you don't have it here, you can always come to Tools, Nugget Package Manager, Package Manager console, and I'm going to say Add Migration, this is the command for adding a new migration here in Visual Studio. And now I have to write the name of the migration, which in my case is going to be initial. Again, as you can see, I have here in a pop-up the equivalent command for Entity Framework Core CLI. So let me press enter, and this is going to create a new class in a migrations folder, which we're going to see in just a moment. Here is that class, but before we examine its contents, we're going to go to the Solution Explorer, and we're going to see that here we have migrations. This is the migrations folder, and in here you can see that we have two files, and the first one is the migration that we just created. The second one is just some configurations for Entity Framework Core, but we're just going to focus on the migration. As you can see here, we have two methods, up and down. The up method is the one that is going to run when we want to apply this migration in the database. As you can see here, what we have here is a create table command. So this is going to create a table. What is the name of the table? John Russ. What are the columns of this table? Well, they are ID and name. And what are the characteristics of these columns? Well, for ID, it is going to be of type int, it is not going to be nullable, and also it is going to be an identity, and its initial value is going to be one, and it is going to increment in a one by one manner. The second column is going to be name, it is going to be of type n bar car max, and it is not going to be nullable. And also, as you can see here, we're going to have a primary key, of name pk genres and that primary key is going to be the id column also we have a down method this down method is for when you want to remove a migration besides adding a migration you can remove it and what this is going to do is that it is going to reverse whatever happened here in the up method in our case we have here a drop table command which is going to delete a table and what is that table well the genres table now let me apply those changes in the database. We still don't have any database yet. What we did was to create a migration that expresses in code whatever we want to do in our database. But we still haven't applied the migration. That is what we're going to do next. So let's go back to the package manager console and let's say here, update database. Don't worry, even if in our case we don't have a database yet, Entity Framework Core is going to make sure to create one for us. And with this, we have our database with our genres table. We can go to SQL Server. Let me connect to this SQL Server instance. And we're going to see here, in here, that we have introduction to EF Core ENGDB. And if we expand here, we're going to see that we have genres. We have our genres table, which has two columns, ID and name. And not only that, but we also have EF migrations history. What is this? Well, if we right click on it and we select top 1000 rows, we're going to see that we have one record. And this record is the migration that we just created. The idea here is that Entity Framework Core keeps track of which migrations we have applied in our database. And it does that by adding those migrations into this EF migrations history table. You can safely ignore it, but I just wanted to show you that it exists. Now, you may have a question how it is that this ID column was configured as a primary key. As you can see here, it is a primary key. And as we saw here, indeed, the primary key of this table, it is the ID column. Why is that? Who configured that? And also, the name field is nbarcar max. 
who configure that? How can I change it? What if I want a bar car 150? Well, for that we have to talk about configurations in Entity Framework Core. In Entity Framework Core, there are three ways of making configurations. By convention, by data annotations, and by using the Fluent API. The reason why, and let's go back to the genre class, the reason why ID is a primary key is that by convention, when a field is named ID, it is set to be a primary key. So conventions are all about not having to write configuration code yourself. If I want to have this as a primary key, all I have to do is to name it ID, and Entity Framework Core is going to take care of the rest. If we want to be explicit when doing this configuration, we can use data annotations or the Fluent API. With data annotations, we use attributes. For example, to indicate that this is going to be a primary key, I can say here, key. Control dot to bring this namespace, and now this is going to be marked as the primary key of the genres table. The advantage of doing it like this is that we can use whatever name we want for the property. For example, if I don't want to name it ID, but let's say identifier, this is outside of the convention, but with this configuration, I was able to say that this is going to be the primary key. Another way of performing this same configuration is by using the Fluent API. The Fluent API are methods that we can use to configure Entity Framework Core properties and relationships in one place outside of the entity. So let me delete this and let me go back to the application DB contest because this is the place where we can configure our entities and relationships by using the Fluent API. For that, we have to say override or model creating. Please, please, please leave this here. Do not delete this. So let me just come down here and let me say model builder. Model builder is this parameter that we have here. Model builder entity. I want to work with a genre entity. What do I want to do? Well, I want to say that the genre entity has key, has a primary key. That is the identifier column. And that's it. This is the same that we did before with a key attribute, but in this way, we do it outside of the genre entity. However, this was just an example of showing you the three types of configurations that we have in Entity Framework Core. In my case, whenever possible, I prefer to use configuration by convention. So let's go back here and let me say ID. So now let's configure our name field so that it only accept 150 characters because remember that right now it is an embarcar max. For that, we have to use either data annotations or the Fluent API. However, I want to mention that out of the three configuration types, the Fluent API is the most powerful one. This is the most powerful one because it has all of the configuration options available. In second place, we have data annotations, like the key attribute that we had here before, which have a fair number of configuration options, but not all of them. Finally, we have configuration by convention, which is the one that has the fewest options. Look for example that with conventions, we cannot configure the name field so that it only accepts 150 characters. So here we can see that indeed there are configurations that we cannot do in all configuration styles. To configure this name field to only accept 150 characters, we can use data annotations. Specifically, we can use the string length attribute. So let me say here maximum length 150. But we're not finished yet because what we need to do now is to create a new migration to indicate that we want to modify our database. But before that, let's learn how to do this configuration by using the Fluent API. So let me comment this out and let's go back to the application DB context. And now I want to say again, model builder entity. I want to work with a genre entity and I'm going to say property G name. I want to edit or configure the name property and I want to say has max length of 150. This is the same thing that we did back in the genre class. It is the same. It has the same effect. 
you can use whichever way you prefer. In my case, I will use the Fluent API way. Now, because we want to make a change to our database, we have to create a new migration. So let's go back to Package Manager Console and let's say add migration genre name, enter. And let's see that here we have a warning. That warning is normal because before we used to have Embarcar Max and now we're going to have Embarcar 150, which means that we could lose data. Now, in our case, we don't have any data in our table, so we can safely ignore this warning. Let's go back here because I want to show you that in this migration, we again have a op method that has a alter column command. As you can see here, by the way, we don't have to repeat that we want to create the genres table that is already indicated in this first migration. So this second migration doesn't have to repeat that. It only has to work with the delta, with what we want to change. In our case, we want to alter a column. What column? Well, the name column of the genres table. And the new data type is going to be 150 characters. I mean, Embarcar 150. And the old type was Embarcar Max. Now we can push the changes to our database. So let's go back here, update database, enter. And we can go back to SQL Server Management Studio. And you can see here that we have Embarcar Max, but if I refresh, now you can see that we have Embarcar 150. We are not limited to having a single entity. We can have several. Let's create the actor entity. Let's go back here. Let's go to the solution explorer and let's go to entities. I want to create a new entity. Let's create a new class, actor. And in here, we're going to say ID, name, decimal, fortune, how much money does the actor have? And also date time, date of birth. We want the name field to be of type Embarcar 150. And also I want to indicate the precision that we're going to have for this decimal. And also I want the data type of the SQL Server column to be date and not date time two. So let's do that. For that, let me close here a couple of tabs that I have open so that we have more space. And let's go back, let me save. Let's go back to the application DB contest because we're going to be using, again, the Fluent API. So let me say here, model builder entity. We already know how to do this configuration. I can say property a a name has max length 150. Now let me configure the data type of date of birth. So let me say model builder entity actor property date of birth has column type. The data type of the SQL Server column is going to be date because I don't need to know the time that the actor was born, only the date. Also, we can say model builder, entity, actor, property, a, a, fortune has precision. And here we can indicate the precision and the scale. So what is this about? Let me explain you in just a moment. Let me say that I want to have five and two. This means that we want to have a number of five digits and out of those five, two are going to be decimal values. This means that, for example, one value could be one, two, three, dot, four, five. There are five digits and two of them are decimal. This is what we're saying with a five here and a two here. Now, in our case, this was just an example. I want to have 18 digits because some actors have a lot of money and only two decimal places. Now let's also add a DB set for actors. So let me say DB set actor actors. Now let's create another entity, which is going to be the movie entity. So let me go to the solution explorer, right click on entities, add class movie. Again, let me create some properties, ID, title, bull in theaters, and finally, date time, release date. We can also configure these properties. Let's go back to the application DB context. And again, let's go back to our model creating, model builder, entity, movie, property, 
mm.title and let's say that we also wanted to have 150 characters and I want to do the same that I did here on the data type of the datetime column but here I want to have movie and here I want to have release date release date and date here finally we're going to add a final entity which is going to be a comment which will represent a comment that a user makes about a movie so let's come here entities add class comment and let me put here id I want to have a string but it's going to be nullable because not always the user has to write a comment about the movie because they could only say if they recommend it or not. So like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. All right, so now we can go back here to the application DB contest and let's write a DB set for both movie, movies, and comment and comments. Now we can add a migration. Let me add a migration, add migration, several entities. And let's see that indeed we're going to be creating an actor's table, a comments table, and also a movies table. Before we continue, I want you to see that we're not limited to using the default entity framework core conventions. We can configure our own conventions. One way to do this is by using the configure convention method on our DB context. For example, let's say, let's go back to our application DB context. Let's say that we're tired of having to do this. We're tired of having to write 150 characters for a lot of our strings in our entities. So I want to centralize that in one place. So what I want to do is to create a new convention. So let's come here and let's say override configure conventions. We can delete this and now I can say configuration builder properties a string. So this is going to be a configuration for a strings and I'm going to say have max length of 150. Now I can remove this, I can remove this, I can remove this because this is now the convention. So I don't need to explicitly configure this. If we want to configure a string with a different value, we can do it. For example, remember that we have a content string field in the comment entity. Let's say that I want to have an embarker 500 for that field. So that what I can do is to say here, model builder entity comment property content has max length 500. Now with this, I can add a new migration, add migration, I'll call it content comment 500, enter, and let's see that. Now here I have embarker 500 for the content column. If we go back to the previous migration, to the several entities migration, we can see that we indeed had embarker max but now because we have a new convention that says 150 and we said that we want to make a specific configuration for the content column of the comment table we can see that we have embarcar 500. now let me close this and let's see that here in this on model creating we have configurations that belong to different entities although it is not a lot of code this may grow in the future an alternative that we can use is to put these configurations in their own files segmented by entity. Let's see that. Let me create here in entities a new folder. I'll call it configurations. I'll right click and I will add a new class. I'll call it genre config. As its name implies, here we are going to put the configuration for the genre entity. So let me say here, I entity type configuration control dot to bring this namespace genre control dot to implement this interface. And in here, what we're going to do is that we're going to go back here and we're going to look for whatever configuration we have for our genre entity. Now, of course, in our case, we don't have anything because we are using here 
convention-based configuration because this is ID and not identifier anymore. And here we also have another convention, but just for completeness, I'm going to put this here. Now let me do the same for the other entities. Let's go with actor now. So let's say here class actor config enter I entity type configuration actor control dot implement interface. And now let's go back to the application DB context and let me cut this from here and let me paste this here. And I will say builder because I want to change this for builder like this and also here. Now let's do the same for the movie. Let's make a movie config file. Movie config. Again, I entity type configuration movie control dot implement interface. And let's bring here the configuration for the movie entity. Let me paste this here and let me say here builder. Finally, let's do the same for the comment entity. So configurations at class comment config identity type configuration comment implement interface. And let's go back to the application DB contest and let me cut this from here and let me paste that here and also builder and let me paste this here. Now we must configure our application DB contest so that it reads all of these configurations that we put here in this configuration folder. What we're going to do is that we're just going to read all of the configurations that we have in this assembly. So what we're going to do is that we're going to go back to the application DB context. Let me remove this empty space and in here I will say model builder dot apply configurations from assembly and I will pass the executing assembly. So I will say assembly control dot system reflection get executing assembly. With this the configurations will get applied and now we have all of that configuration in those classes and we have this application DB context clean. We have several scatter entities. It is time for us to configure the relationships between them. We will start with a one-to-many relationship between movie and comment. This relationship is a one-to-many relationship because each movie will have a collection of comments while each comment will correspond to a single movie. To configure relations in Entity Framework Core, we can use configuration by convention. Of course, we can also use the Fluent API, but we're not going to do that in this video. What we will do is configure navigation properties between our entities. A navigation property allows us to obtain the related data of an entity in a simple way. Thus, if I want to load a movie along with its respective comments, I can do it using one of the techniques that we will see later. We'll start by adding a navigation property in comment. So let me go to the comment entity and in here I will add our movie navigation property and also I need to add a movie ID. Let me say here movie ID. This movie ID is going to contain the ID of the movie to which this comment belongs to. And now I will do the same for movie. I can go to movie, but since a movie has a collection of comments, I will not use a single comment, but a collection of comments, specifically a hash set of comments. We use a hash set because it is more performant than other alternatives like list. Now let me say here new new hash set. In this way, we have configured a one-to-many relationship between movie and comments. I can add a migration. Let me say add migration, movies and comments, enter. And we're going to see that indeed here we have that we're adding a new column to the comments table and that is the movie ID column. But not only that, we're creating an index in the same column so that it is easy for us to look for comments of a movie and also the most important thing is that we're adding a foreign key. So we're linking together those two tables, the comments table and the movies table. And of course, the principal table in this relationship is the movies table, which is the one that has the principal column ID. And we have on delete cascade. This means that if we delete a movie, 
that deletion is going to cascade over our comments table and it is going to delete those comments that belong to that movie. Another type of relationship is the many-to-many -many relationship. We are going to establish it between movie and genre. That is, each movie will correspond to several genres and each genre will correspond to several movies, just like in real life. For example, the Avengers movie has several genres, such as action and science fiction, while the action genre corresponds to several movies, such as Avengers, Spider-Man, or Batman. So it is a many-to-many -many relationship. In Entity Framework Core 7, there are two ways to configure this relationship, those with skip navigation and those without the skip. The idea of the navigation skip is that the entities are directly related to each other, and not through an intermediate entity. Let's look at an example of both ways. We will start with the configuration with skip navigation. Here is where we will place a navigation property from genres to movies and from movies to genres. So let me go to genre, let me close some of the tabs that I have open, and let's go to genre, and in here, as we said, a genre corresponds to several movies, so I can use a collection like hash set. So let me say here, hash set movie, movies, and new hash set movie. All right. So now let's go to movie and I'll do the same. I'll say hash set of genre because a movie has several genres. So genres. And now let's say new hash set. With this, we can add a migration. So let me say package manager console at migration movies and genres enter. Now let's explore this migration and let's see that we are creating a new table. What is this? We are creating a genre movie table. And this genre movie table is going to contain the ID of the genre and the ID of the movie. So if, for example, we have an Avengers movie and it has two genres like science fiction and action, then we are going to create two records in this table. One for saying that we have the Avengers movie with the science fiction genre and another record for saying that we have the Avengers movie again, but with the action genre. So as you can see, we have an intermediate table. A many-to-many -many relationship requires an intermediate table to work. And besides this, as you can see here, we have that this table is going to have a composite primary key, which means that the primary key is going to be composed of several columns. In this case, the genres ID column and the movies ID column. But again, what I want to point out here is that we have an intermediate table. As I was saying, we have another way to configure many-to-many -many relationships, and it is without skipping the intermediate entity. The idea is that, as we saw in this migration, in order to set up a many-to-many -many relationship, we need an intermediate table. Now we have the option of creating an entity that represents that table. We can have, for example, in this case, we could have an entity that represents this genre movie table. And that is what we're going to do, but with another many-to-many -many relationship. I want to set up a many-to-many -many relationship between movie and actor. It is a many-to-many -many relationship because, of course, a movie can have several actors and an actor can act in several movies. But also, I want to save some custom data in that intermediate table. Like for example, I want to store the name of the character and also I want to store the order in which the actors will show up. Why? Because when we list the actors of a movie, we always want to have the protagonist to be the first one to appear. And for us to guarantee that, we need to store the order in which we want our actors to appear and we can use the intermediate table, a column in that intermediate table to do that. So that is why, because we want to have extreme control over that intermediate table, I want to have an intermediate entity. So I do not want to skip that intermediate entity. So what we're going to do is that we're going to create that entity. Let's go to entities at class movie actor. And we're going to say here prop movie ID 
prop actor id string character and also order also i want to have some navigation properties like movie and actor actor all right so let's come here let's forgive the null also here and now let me go to the application db context and let me add a new db set for that intermediate table so let me say movie actor and movies actors and now as we said before an intermediate table in a many-to-many -many relationship has a composite primary key so we have to configure that so what we're going to do is that we're going to create a new configuration file for our movie actor entity so let's come here configurations add class movie actor config i entity type configuration movie actor control dot implement interface and let me say here builder has key movie actor new movie actor dot actor id movie id semicolon here now that we have this configured i can go to the movie entity because I want to configure the navigation property that is going to go not from movie to actor, but from movie to movie actor. So let me say here, hash set, because it is a collection, movie actor, movies actors, new this. And the same goes for actor. I want to go to the actor entity and I want to add this navigation property that goes from actor to movie actor. Now, what we're doing that again is that we're not skipping this intermediate entity anymore. Now, let me insert a new migration at migration, movies and actors, enter. And we're going to see that indeed we're creating this intermediate table, but we have more control over the columns. For example, we have the character column and the order column, but Everything else is the same. For example, we have our composite primary key being defined here. So let's go back to the package manager console and let's say update database, enter, so that we apply those changes into our database. Now let's talk about inserting data. We already have a database created and configured. Now we are going to insert data. We will start by inserting data into our simplest table, the genres table. The first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to create a new controller. In a web API and in an SP.NET Core application in general, a controller is a class that allows us to process HTTP requests. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to use a web API, just think of a controller as a class that will have some method that will be executed when the user interacts with our web API. So let me say controller base API controller. This is just some ceremony code that we need to have. So our controller works genres. And now let's get to work on the controller. The first thing that I need is to have an instance of the application DB context class, because it is through this class that I will be able to insert, read, update and delete data from our tables. So. I will put a constructor here and I will say application db contest because I am able to use the dependency injection system to access an instance of the application db contest. That is because if we go back to the program class, let's go to the program class. Remember that we did add db contest application db contest, which means that we are configuring our application db contest to be able to be used using dependency injection. So let me close this and let's go back here to the genres controller and let's say HTTP post public async task action result, which is the typical return type from an action and an action is a method that gets executed in response to an HTTP request to our web API. So let me say post genre control dot entities genre and now let's add a genre into our genres table for that we're going to use our application db context so i will say context dot add genre this doesn't add 
the genre, the record, into the table. What this does is to mark this object with a status of added, which means that next time we save changes with Entity Framework Core, then it is that the record will get inserted into the table. And how do we save changes? Well, by executing the save changes AC method. So let's say await context save changes async. We use save changes async because this is an IO operation and it is good practice to use asynchronous programming when we do IO operations. IO operations simply means that our system is communicating with another system. In our case, our web application is communicating with a database. And finally, we're going to say return OK. With this, we can test. Let's press Ctrl F5 to run our application. And we have here our application. This is Swagger. This is a page that allows us to interact with the actions of each of our controllers. Here we have genres and we have this post that we created API slash genres. This is the route. I can click on here. I can say try it out. We're going to see that we have a lot of text here but we can ignore it for now. We're going to fix this in a few minutes. Right now, I just want to delete all of this. Make sure to delete this last comma. And also, I want to delete this ID from here. And I only want to leave this name. I deleted the ID because the ID is going to be automatically created for me. Remember that we said before that that primary key of ID is going to have a numeric value that is going to start from one and is going to increment one by one. So let me say here, action, I'm going to create a genre of name action. And let me, before I execute, let me go to SQL Server Management Studio. I just want to go to genre, select top 1000, and let's see that it is empty. But now if I click on execute, we're going to get back after a few seconds, a200 OK. And now if we go back here and press F5, we're going to see that indeed we have the action genre in the table. A good practice in web APIs is not to expose our entities to the external world. And by that, I mean that if I come back here, we are exposing our genre entity to the outside world. That is why here before, if you remember, let me refresh the page. If you remember, we have all of this text here because it is taking into account all of the relationships that our genre entity has. But maybe I don't want to expose that because maybe I want my entity to be able to evolve and that doesn't have to break my clients, the clients of my web API. So what can I do about it? What I can do is to create a DTO. DTO stands for data transfer object and it is basically an object that allows me to represent the data that I want to transfer from one place to the other. In this case, I want to be able to transfer the data from the client into the web API of the genre that I want to create. So let's do that. Let's go to the solution explorer and let me create a new folder at folder DTOs and I will create a new class in it class. And I'll call it genre creation DTO. This is a DTO for creating a genre. And as I said, it is going to contain the information that I need to create a genre, which is the name property. So name. And here I can put this. But not only that, I can also specify that it is going to have a string length, maximum length of 150, so that if by any reason I try to create a genre with more than 150 characters, the Web API itself is going to return a validation error. So now let me copy this and let's go back to genres controller and let me paste that here. But now genre is of type genre creation DTO, but we cannot do this because genre creation DTO is not an entity. Genre is an entity, not genre creation DTO. So we have to map this genre creation DTO to a genre data type. Now we can do that manually, but we can also automate it using a library like Automapper. So let's do that. Let me come here. Let's go to the project, right click, manage look at packages, browse, paste, click on here, install. 
And now let me close this and let's come here. And I need to configure auto mapper. So let's go to the solution explorer. Let me create another folder. I'll call it utilities. Right click on it, add class auto mapper profiles. Auto mapper profiles are basically the configurations that we have to have in place in order to be able to map from one type to the other. So if we want to map from genre creation DTO to genre, we have to configure that. So let me say here profile, which is a class that comes from auto mapper. And now I want to put here a constructor and I want to say create map. And here I will say, I want to be able to map from genre creation DTO to genre. And that's it. With this, we are able to map from genre creation DTO to genre. Now I have to configure auto mapper in the program class. So let's go to the program class and let's come down here. Builder services at auto mapper. And I want to say type of program so that auto mapper scans the assembly in which we are in so that it detects that it has this configuration here. Now I can go back to genres controller and now I can use auto mapper for that. I can inject I mapper mapper control dot create an assign as a field. Now let me say here genre creation DTO. And now I will say bar genre. Let me say genre mapper map. Let's map to genre. And I want to map my genre creation DTO variable. And that's actually it. With this, we can press Ctrl F5 one more time to run my application. And let's go back here. And now let's go back to API slash genres. And now see that there is not a lot of information here because now we only have the name property because that is what it has my genre creation DTO. So now let me say comedy. Let's see that this works. And let's say execute. And now we can go back here and let's see that indeed we have comedy. It is not mandatory to use DTOs, but it is a good practice, especially in a web API. We can also insert multiple records using at range. Let's see an example. I can copy this. I will basically repeat this example, but now I will receive an array of genre creation DTO. And also I need to put here a name like several so that we can differentiate these two endpoints. And here I want to map to an array of genres. So this is going to be genres. And instead of add, I want to use add range because I want to add several genres and genres here. And that's actually it. Let's now run our application again. And we're here and let's go to several. Try it out. And as you can see here, we have an array so I can copy this put a comma here and paste this here. And here I can put drama. And after that, I can put biography. All right, so let's execute this. And let's see that indeed we have a 200 OK. And if we go back to SQL Server F5, we have drama and biography. Also, by the way, I think I haven't mentioned this, so let me do it. You can open the console. Here, you can open the console that gets created when we run an SP.NET Core application. And you're going to see that here we have the code that gets executed into the database. So I just wanted to show you that. All right, so let me close this and let's continue. Now let's insert an actor. So let's go back to Visual Studio and let's repeat the process. Let me close a few things because we have too many things open. Let's go to the Solution Explorer. Let's go to Controllers, right click, Add Class, Actors, controller and just like we did before we're going to have some ceremony code api controller route api actors controller base and let me put here ctor because i want to have the constructor application db context context i mapper mapper control dot create and assign remaining as fields and let me control dot this and import auto mapper. And now again, let me make an HTTP post. We are basically going to write the same code that we did before, just so that you can see that we can reuse basically the same logic between different actions because it is the same API. Now I will create 
and actor creation DTO. So let me go here and create an actor creation DTO class. And what I'm basically going to do is that I'll go to the actor class and I'll just copy these three properties and I'll paste them here in actor creation DTO. If I want to, I can put here this data annotation. All right, so now I can go back to actors controller and I can say actor creation DTO control dot to import the corresponding namespace. And you are going to see that basically we are going to use the same code. Let me do this again because it didn't go through the previous time. So now it's done. So basically what I'm going to do is that I will use the same code that I used here. Let's see that. Let me go back to actors controller and let me say bar actor equal to mapper map. We're going to map from actor creation DTO to actor. And of course we have to configure that in the auto mapper profile class. So let me do that. Let's go back here and let me just clone this line and say actor creation DTO and I will project to actor and then let's go back to actors controller and let me say actor and I'm going to pass actor creation DTO semicolon here and again I have to import in this case the entities namespace and then let's say context at actor semicolon here await context save changes async return ok with this, we are good to go. Again, this is basically the same code, which is something that I like a lot about Entity Framework Core because once you learn something, you can use it in many places. So let me press Ctrl F5 to run our application. Let's go back here. Here we have actors and API actors. Try it out. And I can put whatever name I want, like Tom Holland, Fortune 500 grand. And the year is going to be 1998, one, two. Execute. And we have a 200 OK. And if we go back to SQL Server, and let me refresh here on tables so that we get all of the tables, actors, select top 1000. And here we have our friend Tom Holland. Now let's insert a movie. This case is interesting because we will learn how to insert related data. That is, we remember that a movie has genres and actors. So we're going to create a movie and we're also going to link it with existing genres and actors. So let's go to Visual Studio to do that. Let's go here, Solution Explorer, Controllers, at Class, Movies, Controller. And again, the ceremony that we always do is this one, so I'll just copy and paste it. We have movies controller, controller base, API controller, route, API movies, application DB content and iMapper being injected into our controller. Now let's create our DTO. Let's go to DTOs at class movie creation DTO. And we're going to create two DTOs. This is the first one. So let me say here, let's go to movie. I want to go to the movie entity. And I will copy title in theaters and release date. And let's go to movie creation DTO and paste this. And also I'm going to create a list of genres, but for genres, the only thing I need to be able to link a movie with a genre is the ID of the genre. So this is going to be a list of IDs. So let me say here, genres, new list. All right. And also I need a list of actors because remember that a movie is also linked to the actors table, but besides needing the actor ID, I also need the character name and also the order in which the actor is going to appear. That is something that we're going to do in the controller. I mean the order part, but we need to receive the character. So for that, we're going to create a new DTO. I can just put it here or I can create a new file just for this DTO. I'm just going to keep it simple and have it here. So movie actor creation DTO actor ID. This is the ID of the actor and also a string character. All right. This is the name of the character 
that the actor plays in the movie. So now list of movie actor creation DTO movies actors and then new list. Let me put this in another line so that you can visualize everything better. Now let's go to movies controller and let's work. So HTTP post public async task action result post movie creation DTO movie creation DTO I'm going to map so I'm going to map to movie so movie equal to mapper map movie movie creation DTO and let me import the entity's namespace and now I need to configure this mapping. So let's go to auto mapper profiles, which I have here. And now let's configure this mapping. Let me say here, create map from movie creation DTO to movie. Now, remember that here in movie creation DTO, we have genres as a list of int. And in movie, we have genres, but as a collection or hash set of genre. So I need to figure out a way to go from an int into a genre. For that, what I'm going to do is that for each int, I'm going to create a new genre object with set int as its ID. All right, so let's go to AutoMapper profiles to do just that. Let me say for member, for a member, for the genres member this represents an entity by the way comma what do i want to do well i want to go to the dto so dto and i want to map from as i said i want to map from the genres field so genres which remember is a list of ints so let me put this here it's a list of ints so for each int i want to create a new genre right and let me say here id new genre i'm going to instantiate a new genre and i'm going to make the int in genres the id of the genre all right let me close here and finally we also have to map from movie actor creation dto to movie actor so let me configure that let me say create map movie actor creation dto to movie actor and now let's go to movies controller uh, let's get to work. Let's say if movie genres is not null here, what I'm going to do is that I need to change the state of the genres that I'm receiving. Why is that? Well, because entity framework core doesn't know that these genres that I have here that I'm creating here, entity framework core doesn't know that they correspond to existing genres in our database. So we need to tell to Entity Framework Core that they are already existing genres. And there is an status that we can mark the genre entity with so that Entity Framework Core knows that they already exist in the database. And that is unchanged. That is the name of the status, unchanged. So let's go back to Movies Controller. And let me say, for each, I'm going to do a for each genre in Movie Genres. And let me say here, context entry. This entry is going to allow me to modify some of the metadata of the entity. And one piece of metadata that I can configure is the state. And now I can say entity state dot unchanged. As you can see here, by the way, we have states like added, which if you remember several minutes ago, I mentioned that by using this add method that we have in the genres controller by using this add method i said that we are marking this entity as added what this method is doing is modifying the state of the entity to add it so that same added is what we have here as an entity state we also have deleted detach modify and in our case we want to use unchanged which basically mean that it exists but no change has been done to it so let me delete this control dot to bring this namespace so that we don't have that many code in this line and that's it with this what we are doing is that we're linking a new movie that we're going to create to an existing genre 
Now, for actors, remember that we said that we want to store the order of the actor, and we said that we were going to do that in the controller. This is the moment that we're going to do that. So let me say, if movie movies actors is not null, if it is not null, then we're going to do a for, and we're going to say here, movie movies actors count, all right? So I'm going to say movie movies actors dot order equal to i plus one. So basically what I'm doing is that I'm iterating over the actors that I'm receiving from the front end and I'm marking them with the same order as they came in. Now, sadly, because we're using a hash set for performance reasons, we cannot use this code like this. So what do we have to do? Well, we can go back to the movie entity and we can change. Now we have a good reason to not use hash set and to use list, which is less performant, but we actually need to use list in this case. So we are allowed to do this. So let's go back here. And as you can see, there are no errors here anymore. So now let me come here and say context at movie semicolon await context save changes async return okay and with this we can test let me press ctrl f5 to run our application let's go back to swagger and let's go to movies and let me create a new movie so i'm going to say here spider-man far from home in theaters true release date again i'm just going to put here this date genres so for genres i have to be very careful because this needs to correspond to existing genres so let me go to genres and let's see that we have here these four ids i can only use these values i cannot use any value outside of these four so in my case i will use one and two so action and comedy so let's come here and let's say one and two and for movies actors the same logic applies. I have to come back here and see what actors do I have. And in my case, I only have one actor, which is Tom Holland. So I can only use him. So ID one, right? So ID one and character is Peter Parker. Now let me execute. And we're going to see that we have a 200. Okay. And now let's see what we got. Let's go to the movies table. And let's see that we have Spider-Man Far From Home in theaters, true, and release date. But that is not the most exciting part. The most exciting part is that if I go to genre movie, select top 1000, we have Movies ID 1, which is the only movie that I have, and also genres ID 1 and 2, action and comedy, excellent. And not only that, if I go to Movies Actors, we're going to see that we have Movie ID 1, Actor ID 1, character Peter Parker and order one because it is the only actor that I have. So it is of order one. Now let's insert comments. Thus, we will learn how to insert data for a one to many relationship. What we need to have at hand is the ID of the movie to which we want to attach the comment. In our case, as we can see here, we only have one movie, which is the movie of ID one. So that is the one that we're going to use. So Let's go back to Visual Studio and I want to create a new controller, a controller for comments. So class comments controller. And this one is going to be a little bit different than the previous ones, at least for the route. So let me say API controller and now let's put the route here. And what is different is that I'm going to say API slash movies slash movie ID slash comments. This is basically a way to indicate that there is a parent child relationship between movies and comments, because as we can see, we will always have a movie ID when we want to request some comments. Now, besides that, everything else is the same. I can put here our application DB contest and the iMapper. Also, let me say HTTP post public async task action result post int movie id this movie id is going to come from this movie id that we're going to have in the url 
and also I want to have a comment creation DTO. So let me create that DTO right away. Class comment creation DTO. Let me go to the comment entity. Let's go to comment and I'll copy content and recommend. And let's go back here and let me just paste this. And then let's go back to comments controller and let's say comment creation DTO control dot to be in the corresponding namespace comment creation DTO. And then let's say comment equal to mapper map comment control dot to bring the entity's namespace. I will map from comment creation DTO and now let's configure this mapping. Let's go to auto mapper profiles and let me just clone this line and let's say comment creation DTO to comment. We want to map from comment creation DTO to comment. So let's go back to comments controller. And let's say comment dot movie ID equal to movie ID context at comment await context save changes async return OK. All right, now we can test this. Let's press Control F5 to run our application. And here we are. Let's go to comments. As we said, we're going to be using the movie of ID one, which is the only one we have. And for content, I'm going to say. I love it and I will recommend it. All right, so let's execute this and we have a 200. Okay, so let's go back to SQL Server Management Studio and we're going to see that indeed we have the comment created. We have already seen repeatedly that we can insert data using the add method. And by that, I mean this add method that we have here with the safe changes async. However, sometimes we don't want to insert data manually, but instead we want to put the data in migrations so that it is created automatically. For that, we can use data seeding. Let's see an example. Suppose that we want to have some default genres in the database. For that, we can go to the genre config file. Let's go to the genre config file. And in here I can say bar science fiction. I'm going to create two new genres. So new genre ID equal to five. Let's make sure that we don't already have a genre of ID five in the genre table. As you can see here, we only have ID four here as the maximum value. So I can use five and let me say name science fiction. I'll do the same, but this time for animation. Let me say six here. And then here animation. Now I can say builder has data and I can pass science fiction and animation. Now I can add a migration that is going to indicate that we want to insert this data into the database. So let's do that. Let me say package manager console and I will say add migration genre data. And let's see that indeed we have insert data in genres, ID and name, ID five, name science fiction, and ID six and name animation. However, for practice, I want us to add data for each table, but I don't want to have it so that we have to go to different files to configure that. So what I will do is that I will create a central class that is going to contain all of the data seeding code. So let me close everything because I have too many things open. So we have more space. Now, what I was saying is that I want to create a new class that is going to contain the data seeding code. So I'm going to create a folder. I'll call it seeding here in entities, right click on it, add class initial seeding. And because it is a lot of code, I will copy and paste it, but don't worry that we're going to read it line by line. So let me paste this. Let's come up here and let's see what we got. We have a few actors. We have Samuel L. Jackson and Robert Downey Jr. As you can see, they have ID two and three. Then I say model builder entity actor has data, Samuel L. Jackson and Robert Downey Jr. Then we go for movies. We have the Avengers movie and Spider-Man No Way Home. And also we have Spider-Man, Spider-Verse 2 
And then we say Model Builder, Entity, Movie Has Data, Avengers, and the other two Spider-Man movies. Then we go for comments. For comments, remember that we need to also pass the movie ID. So that is why we say, for example, Avengers comment, new comment, ID of the comment, recommend true, content, and movie ID. And here we are using Avengers.id so that we can pass this as a reference. And then we do the same for another comment for the Avengers movie and for No Way Home. And finally, we say entity comment has data and we pass the three comments. Now we get to the little bit advanced part, which is the inserting data in the many to many relationship table. I mean the intermediate table for the many to many relationship between genres and movies with, if you remember, it is a skipping many to many relationship in which we don't have access to the intermediate entity that represent the intermediate table. So in this case, we have to do the following. I put here the name of the table, the name of the table. You can get that from here. You can go to SQL Server Management Studio and you can see that we have genre movie. This is the name of the intermediate table. So I put that here and then for the genre ID property, we have genres ID which again, we can get from here. We have genres ID and movies ID. That is exactly what I'm putting here. And then I'm saying that I want to use the science fiction and animation genre, which we added in the genre config class. And then we use model builder entity and we pass the name of the table in which we want to add data, then has data, new dictionary, a string object, and then the genres ID column, science fiction, and then the movies ID column is going to be equal to the ID of the Avengers movie. And then we do the same for whatever other record we want to insert into the genre movie table. I said this is a little bit advanced because we have to use a lot of code just to insert data into this genre movie table because we don't have access to the intermediate entity. In the case of the many to many without skipping, it is simpler because we have access to the intermediate entity. In this case, movie actor. Remember that there is a many to many relationship between movies and actors. And we have the movie actor entity to represent the intermediate table. So as you can see here, we only need to use that class as a normal class. And then we can use model builder entity movie actor has data and we can pass the corresponding movies actors. And that's it. Then now that we have this class, we need to tell the application DB context about this class. So let me say application DB context and let's go to on model creating. Then I'm going to say initial seating console dot dot seat. And then we're going to pass the model builder and that's it with this. We're applying this seating that we have here. All right. So let's add a new migration. Let's say add migration tons of data and we're going to see that indeed we have that data here and now let me say update database to push these changes into the database now that we have all of this data in the database we can work with querying data now we're going to read data from our tables so let me close this and this and let's continue what we're going to do is that we're going to go to genres controller let me go to genres controller to the genres controller class and we're going to create a new action. It is going to be an HTTP get because we want to get information. So let me say public async task action result. We're going to do the simplest example and then we're going to do more complicated examples later on. So I enumerable, I want to return an I enumerable of genres. And we're going to say get. And the simplest way to get data from a table is to use to list. So let me say return await context genres because we want to access the data of the genres table to list async. All right. And that's it. With this, we are getting all of that data from the genres table. Let's see that. Let me press control F5 to run our application. Let's go back to Swagger and let's see that now here in genres we have get. So let me click on it and let me say try it out, execute. And we're going to see that now. We have action, comedy, drama, biography, science fiction, and animation. And as always, 
We can do the same in another controller. For example, we can use basically the exact same code in actors. Let's see that. Let me go to actors. Let's go to actors controller. And let's see that I can paste this code here. And the only thing that I need to change is actor here and actors here. And that's actually it. With this, we have a query that gets all of the actors of the actors table. So let's go back here and let's go to actors, get, try it out, execute. And we're going to see that now we have Tom Holland, Samuel L. Jackson and Robert Downey Jr. Again, as you can see, we can basically reuse code between entities to do the same operations. But what if we don't want to get all of the data from a table? Well, for that, we can use filters. For example, we can build a search by name functionality for actors. Let's do that. Let's come here. We are in the actors controller. And let's say HTTP get name, because I want to search by name, public async task action result I enumerable of actor get a string name the name of the actor I'm going to name this version one because I'm going to have another version in just a moment so let's say return await context actors where I want to filter and I want to say where the actor where the name of the actor is equal to the name that I'm getting here. Then I'm going to say to list async. Now we can test this. So let me compile. Let's go back here. And now let's see that we have API actors name. Try it out. I can write here a name. For example, I can say Tom Holland execute. And now let's see that we have here only Tom Holland because he's the only one that has that name. Now, the problem with doing it like this, the problem with doing it like this is that this requires an exact match. For example, if I come here and I write instead of Tom Holland, just Tom, it is not going to return anything because it is not an exact match. That is why I prefer to use contains in these scenarios. So let's make another version of our search by name method. I'll name this version two here and v2 here version two and instead of using this code i will say where the name contains whatever value i have here now this is more flexible because for example tom holland contains tom and therefore we are going to be able to retrieve tom holland's record by only writing tom Let's see that. Let's come here, v2, let's say Tom, execute. And let's see that now we have Tom Holland. And also if I write J, execute, we're going to see that we have Samuel L. Jackson and Robert Downey Jr. both have J in their names. We can also use binary Boolean operators such as AND in the word function. For example, suppose we want to search for actors by date of birth but we want to use a range. So let's see that. Let's come here and let me say here, HTTP get date of birth range. And let me say public async task action result I enumerable of actor get date of birth, date time start and date time end. Return await context actors where and I want to say where the actor where the date of birth of the actor is greater than or equal to the start date and the same date of birth is less than or equal to the end date and then we have to say of course to list async and with this we can test let's come here and let's see that let me see the dates that we have for the actors we see that for example we have Tom Holland in 1998 this one in 48 and 65. So I'm going to go from 45 to 70. So let's come here, date of range. And let's say from 1945, one, one to 1970s, one, one. So which actors were born between these two dates? Let's see. 
So, of course, we have Samuel L. Jackson and Robert Downey Jr. If we want, instead of getting all of the rows of a search, we can get the first one only by using first or default. For example, let's come here and let's come down here and let me say HTTP get and what I'm going to do is that I will receive here an ID, which is going to be an integer public async task action result of actor. I don't have to return an enumerable because I know that I will only be getting one actor at most int ID. And let me say var actor equal to await context actors first or default async. And in here I can pass x.id where the actor has the same ID that I'm passing here. And then I can say if actor is null, because this is first or default. What does this mean? What does first or default means? First or default means that it is going to get either the first actor that has this ID, or if there is no actor with that ID, then it is going to get the default value for the actor entity. And because the actor entity is a class and therefore it is a reference type, the default value of a reference type is null. So this is going to be null in the case that there is no actor with the ID that we have here. So if actor is null, I want to say return not found, a 404 not found. Otherwise, I want to return actor. Let's test this. Let me compile and let's come back here. So let's go to ID, try it out. Let me say, for example, to execute. And as we can see here, we have a single actor. Now, if I write, for example, 20, I don't have an actor of ID 20. So we're going to get a 404 not found. Also, we can choose the order in which the records will appear using order by. For example, let's go to genres. I want to go to genres and let's see that we have action, comedy, drama, biography. As we can see, it is not order by the name, but by the ID. What if I want to order by the name? We can do that. Let's come back here. Let's go to genres controller. And here in this get method, I can say order by, by which column? Well, by the name column. And that's it. Control F5 to run my application one more time. And let's go to genres and let's go to get, try it out, execute. And we're going to see that we have action, animation, biography, comedy, all the way through science fiction, which means that indeed now we have it ordered by name. Also, we can order in a descending manner. This was in an ascending manner. We can use a descending manner by using order by descending. And it is exactly the same. Let's see that. Let's come back here and let's say genres, get, try it out, execute. And now we're going to get from science fiction, as you can see here, from science fiction to action. So it is ordered in a descending manner. Something very interesting is that we can order by several columns. That is, for example, we can order first by the name field, in the case of an actor, and then by the date of birth field. For example, let's go to SQL Server Management Studio, and let me go to actors, edit top 200 rows, because this will allow me to easily do this. I want to put the same name here, even the same fortune, but I want to have a different date of birth. For example, 1950, 12, 21. Enter. So now we have two actors with the same name, but they have a different date of birth. How can we order them first by name and then by the date of birth column. Well, for that, we have two special methods in Entity Framework Core. So let's go to Actors Controller and let's go to the name method. And let's see that I can order by, let me say order by, we know that we can order by name. That is easy. We already know how to do that. But how then I order by another column. Well, I can use then by, then by and then by descending. With then by, I can order by a second column in an ascending manner and then by descending in a descending manner. So for example, if I say then by and I say here x date of birth, let's see what we get. Let me compile my application and let's go back here 
and let's go to actors, name two. I'll just say J, just so that we can have Robert Downey Jr. also in the result set. So we have Robert Downey Jr., the first one, Samuel L. Jackson, the second one, and Samuel L. Jackson, the third one. And we have it so that we have first the Samuel L. Jackson that was born in 1948. And the second one is the one from 1950. So let's flip them. Let's order by the date of birth, but in a descending manner. So then by descending, now let's compile and let's see what we get. Let's go to name version two, try it out, J, execute. And let's see that now we have Robert Downey Jr. first, that is fine, but Samuel L. Jackson, the one from 1950. And the second one is the one from 1948, which means that indeed we were able to first order by name, but then if the name are equal, then we order by date of birth, in this case, in a descending manner. In addition to selecting records by using a word, a filter, we can also select which columns we want to fetch. For example, as we can see here, we are getting the ID, the name, the fortune, the date of birth, but maybe we don't want all of that, but maybe we just want the ID and the name of an actor. Let's see that. Let's come back here and let's come down here. For example, here, HTTP get ID and name, public async task action result, get ID and name, and now let me say actors equal to await context actors and we can use the select function so that we indicate which columns we want to fetch so let me say here new x.id and x.name i can use it this way to indicate that i want to project from actor this is like a mapping i want to map from actor to an anonymous type so let me say here to list async and then return actors though i should say okay so that we can return this this is because i'm saying that i want to return an action result and then in order for this to work i have to say okay actors the reason why i can put here a data type it is because i just said that i'm mapping to an anonymous type so i cannot represent that here but we will see a fix for that in just a moment. For now, let's see that this works. Let me compile my application and let's go back here and let's say ID and name, try it out, execute. And let's see that now we only have the ID and the name of the actors. We have Tom Holland, Samuel, Robert, and Samuel again, because we have two Samuel L. Jacksons. Now, if we don't want to use an anonymous type like we did here, we can build a DTO. For example, let's go to DTOs at class actor dto and let me put here id and name and now i can come back to actors controller and i can say here i enumerable of actor dto and let me put this like this and now i can say here new actor dto so i will be mapping not to an anonymous type, but to an actor DTO. So let me say here ID equal to ID and the name property is going to be equal to name. And then I don't even need this anymore. So I can say actors. Now you see these purple lines that is because of a hot reload functionality that wants me to compile my application. That is done. Now the lines will disappear and we can go back here and let's go to ID and name and you are going to see that it is the same. So we got the same result, but now we are using a DTO. We saw that we have related data. For example, a movie has comments. How can we query the data of a movie with its comments? There are several techniques for doing this. We will see two, eager loading and select loading. Let's start with eager loading. The idea of eager loading is that we must indicate when we want to load the related data of an entity. For example, let's go to movies controller, let's go to movies controller, and let's go here, and let's say HTTP get, I want to pass an ID, public async task, action result of movie, get int ID, and we're going to use the same code 
that we use here so I can even reuse it let me look for this one so I can reuse this let me paste this here and let me say movie movies all right so let's see what we have let me compile my application let's go here and let's go to movie we remember that we have some movies let me see which one has comments so let's go to comments and we're going to see that for example the movie of id2 has two comments all right so i will use that one so let me go here id2 execute and we're going to see that indeed we have avengers endgame but we don't have the comments why is that well as i said i need to be explicit about the fact that i want to load the related data in the case of eager loading i do that by using include and then i can pass here the navigation property of comments so i can say comments and that's actually it with this i can compile i can go back here i can go back to movies try it out and then to execute and let's see that we have here an error a possible object cycle was detected what is this well the problem is the following let's go to movie and we're going to see that movie has a reference to comment and let's go to comment and we're going to see that comment has a reference to movie which again has a reference to comment so we have this circular reference between movies and comments and the json serializer is complaining that it doesn't know what to do so it just throws an exception how can we fix this well there is an easy fix actually so we can go to the program class we can go here and say add json options 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 json serializer options reference handler equal to reference handler dot ignore cycles and this is going to fix the issue for me all right let me put this in this manner so that you can visualize everything on the screen now another solution if you don't want to do this another solution would be to use dtos for example to have that you will return a movie dto and a comment dto in such a way that they don't have a circular reference between them but in our case we will just keep it simple and we're going to implement this solution so let me run my application let's go back here and let's go back to movies again try it out id2 execute and let's see that indeed we have avengers endgame and we have the comments very good and i love it also we can get genres and movies actors let's see that let's come back here let's go back to movies controller and let's go here and let's say include genres and also include movies actors and let's compile and let's go back here let's go back to movies and let's see that in try it out id2 execute we have the comments of course the genres like science fiction and the movie actors like nick fury for the character and iron man for the other character but as we can see here we don't have the name of the actors for example we know that Nick Fury is played by Samuel L. Jackson, but we don't have his name here. Why is that? Well, remember that in our many-to-many -many relationship between movie, between movie and actors, we have the movie actor entity sitting between them. So if we go to movie actor, we don't have here the name of the actor. We have the actor ID, which is what we have here, actor ID, but we don't have the name here. What we have to do is to now load the data of the actor that corresponds to that movie actor. How can we do that? Well, that's very simple. We have to go back to movies controller and after this include, we can say then include, which will allow me to go to the movie actor entity and indicate that in there I want to load the actor entity. And that's actually it. With this, we can compile and we can go back here. And now let's go to movies try it out id2 execute and we can see that now in movies actors we have yes character nick fury but also actor samuel l jackson so as you can see we are loading the data of the actor and the same goes for iron man with its actor which is robert downey jr but let's observe that 
we have order two here and order one here, so they are not appearing in the correct order. How can we order by these related data? Well, for that, we can do the following. We can go back to this include movies actors dot order by order by and we can order by movie actor movie actor order and let me close this parenthesis and let me compile my application and let's go back here and we can see that if we go back here id2 execute let's see that indeed now we have it in the correct order we have order one here and order two here so far, we have been loading all of the columns from all of the tables involved in a relationship, but maybe we don't want this. To fix this, we can use a select as we have already seen. When we use a select to load related data, we call it select loading. Let's see. Let's come back to Visual Studio, and I'm basically going to clone this, but I will call it here select for select loading and get select. So instead of using include, we're not going to be using includes anymore for select loading, but we will use select. So let me say select and I'll say move of movie. So new, again, we can map to an anonymous type or to ADTO. In our case, to keep it simple, we're only going to be using an anonymous type. So ID equal to move ID, let's say that I want the ID of the movie, title equal to move.title, genres, let's say that I want the genres, so let me say move.genres.select, and let's say that I only want the name of the genres, so let me say here, name to list. Also, let me say that I want the actors, so actors, so let me say move movies actors, order by we have to order by movie actor movie actor order and then i want to do a select i want to make a projection because i only want to have the following information of the actors so i want to have the id of the actor which is going to be ma actor id name ma actor name and also character i want to have the character so character equal to ma character and then comma and we made a mistake here this should have been an equal sign all right so finally i don't want to bring the comments but only the amount of comments we have so comments quantity equal to move comments count and look how easy it was for me to retrieve this information. I'm very intuitive also. So now let me correct this. Let me fix this here because again, this is an anonymous type. So let me say here, okay, and movie. Now let me compile my application and you are going to see that now we have the same data, but without all of the extra columns that we don't need. All right, so here we are. Let's go to movie, select, try it out, two, execute. And let's see that now we have ID2, Title Avengers, Genre Science Fiction, Actors, these two actors, and Comments Quantity 2. Alright, so now let's talk about updating records. Let's start with genres. In Entity Framework Core, you can update records in two ways, with the connected model and with the disconnected model. Just for testing, let's look at a connected model example. Let's go back to Visual Studio. Let's go to the genres controller and let's come down here and let's say HTTP put. I want to have here ID int and also name to. What I'm going to do is that I'm just going to add a two at the end of the name of the genre. Again, this is just a simple example to explore the connected model for updating records in Entity Framework Core. Let me say here var genre equal to await context genres. The first thing that I need is to bring the genre from the database. So let me say GID equal equal to ID. If genre is null, there is nothing that I can do. So I will just return not found. Otherwise, and this is the 
connected model, basically when we load data with Entity Framework Core by default, Entity Framework Core keeps track of the changes that that entity suffers. For example, if I say genre.name equal to genre.name plus two, so we're adding two at the end of the name, and Entity Framework Core takes notice of this. So if we say await context save changes async, this change that we did to the object is going to get replicated into the corresponding record in the genres table. So let's see that. Return OK. Let me test this. Let's come back here and let's say that we can go to genre spot. Try it out. Let me see which one we can update. Let me see here in genres. Let's go to genres. Select top 1000. Let me update drama, for example. So three, so three, execute. And this is done. Now, if I go back here, F5, we're going to see that we have drama two. However, in web environments, it is normal, but not mandatory to use the disconnected model. The disconnected model is used like this. So let's come back here. And instead of doing it like this, I will do the following. I will say, HTTP put id int public async task action result put int id and we're going to get for example a DTO it could be some sort of genre of the DTO but in our case just to save some time we're going to be reusing the genre creation DTO so genre creation DTO so in the disconnected model we're going to have a genre instance so let me say here for example mapper map genre we want to map from genre creation DTO to genre now this genre instance was not loaded by a DB context right because here we have genre and that was loaded by the DB context so this is why it is called the connected model because the DB context that loaded this data is the same one that is going to update it but in here we have this genre object that wasn't loaded by a DB context and now our DB context has to save that data into a database. So that is why it is called the disconnected model because the DB context that is going to save the data is not the one that loaded that genre. So let's come here and let's say genre.id equal to id. And now I will say context update genre. And with this, I'm basically marking this genre as to be updated. Just like before, with this add, I was marking the status of this genre as added or to be added. Now I'm marking this as to be updated. So now I'm going to say await context save changes. And now it is when the genre in the database is going to get updated. And now let me say return OK. So now let's test this. Let me press Ctrl F5 to run our application. Let's go back here. Let's go back to genres and let me use this one. Now I will update drama one more time. Remember that ID3 is for drama. And now I will just put drama here so that we remove these two that we have at the end of the name drama. So let me say execute. And let me see that we have a 200 OK. Let me refresh here. And now we have drama. Another thing we can do is delete records. For that, we have two ways. In Entity Framework Core 7, there is a new way to delete records. I will teach you the new way and the old way. We'll start with the new one. In order to delete a record in a very efficient manner, we can use the following code. Let me come here to genres controller and let me say HTTP delete. I'll say here id int modern public async task action result delete int id and let me say bar altered rows and i'll explain you what altered rows means in just a moment await context genres where let me use a where id equal to id and then execute delete async so what is this so basically i am doing a filter i'm trying to get the genres that has this id that we're getting here 
and then I'm executing a delete operation over those records. Now, what this returns is the total number of rows that were deleted in the database. So that is what I call alter rows. This is a number. This is the amount of rows that were removed from the database. So if this number is equal to zero, if alter rows, alter rows is equal to zero, or we can just call it removed rows. If the removed rows is equal to zero, then it means that no record exists with this genre ID. So we can safely return not found. Otherwise, if this was not zero, so it was one, for example, then we can return okay or no content, which is basically the same. It is a 204. It is a still a successful operation. Now, let me make a test. Let me come here. I want to right click on genres, edit top 200 rows, and let me say test genre. And now I will delete this genre. So let's see that indeed we have it here now, test genre. All right, so control F5 to run our application. Let's come back here and let's see that we can delete the genre of ID seven. So execute and let's see that we have a 204, no content. So now let's come here and let's see that indeed we don't have test genre anymore. Now, just in case you run into it, or maybe you need it because you are using an old version of Entity Framework Core, I will teach you the old way of deleting a record. So let me say here, HTTP delete ID int old way, public async task action result, delete old way int ID. And now I will do the following. I will say bar genre equal to await context genres first or default async g dot id equal equal id so i needed to load the record in memory and then if the record is null then we say not found and after that i was able to say context remove genre semicolon here await context save changes async so just like before when we say context.add we are just marking the entity to be added and in here we're saying context remove so we are marking the entity the status of the entity as to be removed so it will be removed or deleted from the table when we do a save changes async so now let's say return no content but it works basically the same as the previous one, as this one, but this one is more efficient because you don't need to load the record in memory for deleting it. Now, there are occasions in which you may need to use this. For example, if you need to access the data of the genre before deleting it, so you may need it anyway in the future. Now, let's see what happens when we delete an entity with related data, like a movie. For example, let me come here, let me copy this, and let's go to movies controller. I want to reuse that code to save some time. So let me say here, instead of genres, movies, and that's it. With this, we have replicated the code. And now we can press control F5 to run our application one more time. And let's go back to movies. And let me delete a movie that has comments. For example, I will delete the movie of ID3 because remember that if we go to comments, we're going to see that the movie of ID3 has a comment, which is this one. So we're going to see that when we delete the movie, we're going to get the comment also removed. So we can see a 204 here and let's go back here and let's see that now we don't have the comment of ID4 anymore. And of course, we deleted the movie of ID3. If we go back here, we can see that we don't have a movie of ID3 anymore. Another thing that Entity Framework Core lets us do is define indexes. For example, suppose we want the name of a genre to be unique. That is, two genres cannot have the same name. Well, for that, I can create an index. Let's go back to Visual Studio to do that. Let's go to genre config. And in here, I can define the index. I can configure the index. Let me say builder has index. And I can say, the property name or the name property is unique, is unique. Very good. 
Now with this, I can add a new migration, add migration, genres, name, index. And this is going to indicate that we want to create a unique index for the name column. Now let me say update database to push these changes into our database. And now let me control F5 my application because we're going to see that now I can't create two genres with the same name. So let's go back here and let's see that if I go to genres post here, let me say drama. We know that we have a genre of name drama. We're going to see that we get a nasty exception as you can see here. Of course, if you don't want to show this to the user, you can do something much better, which is a validation. We can come here, for example, to this post and I want to say bar genre exists with that name, await context genres, any async. We can use any to verify that a record exists or not. So we don't want to load a record. We only want to know if it exists. So this is very efficient. So let me say name equal equal genre creation DTO dot name. Say my column here and let me put this in another line so that you can visualize everything better. And now if genre exists, genre exists with that name. If this is true, then return bad request. There's already a genre with the name and let me just concatenate the name here. Genre creation DTO name semicolon here. All right, so let me compile my application and let's come back here and let's do the same. But now we're going to get a much, much friendly error. So let me go to post, try it out, drama and execute. And let's see that indeed we have, there is already a genre with the name drama, much better. Another cool thing about working with Entity Framework Core is transactions. The idea of a transaction is that we can work several operations as if it were one, in such a way that if there is a problem, then none of the operations is carried out. By default, when we use safe changes, we already have a transaction mechanism. For example, remember that we have this endpoint several that allows us to insert several genres. So what I want to do is that I want to say the following test transaction genre one. So I want to add this like this. So I'm going to have test transaction one, test transaction two and test transaction two again. This means that we are going to have two genres with the same name. Now this one doesn't have that problem. But because it will be part of the same transaction, none of the operations will go through. Let's see that. Let's execute and let's see that we have an error again because of that unique index. But if we go back to SQL Server Management Studio and we go to genres, select top 1000, we're going to see that we don't have any of the new genres. Why is that? Well, because if we go back to Visual Studio and we go back to the genres controller, let's go to several. We're going to see that we have one safe changes, which means that all of the operations that we're doing are part of one transaction. And if one of the operations fail, then all of them fail. Finally, we're going to publish our web API in Azure so that we can see that it is very easy to configure a database with Entity Framework Core in the cloud. So, let me go to the Solution Explorer and let me come down here to the Upsetting Development.json because I want to copy this default connection name and I want to have it here in a file and also this connection strings just in case I need it. I'll put it here because I will need it in a few minutes. So let me close everything and let's come here and let me minimize all of this. Right click, publish. Of course, if you want to publish on Azure, you need an Azure account. So I already have one, so I can move forward. So let me go to Azure, Azure Windows, Azure App Service. We're going to use an Azure App Service. So I will use my Visual Studio Enterprise subscription. I'll say create new. I want to create a new App Service. I can leave this name. I don't mind. And I can use a resource group. I can use a new one. Intro to EFK. 
core ENG, a resource group allows me to group resources in Azure, like a database, a web application, and so on, on a single unit. I can also define a new hosting plan, which is the one that says how much I'm going to pay depending on the characteristics of my web server. I can use a V1, which is fine, okay, create. Now, this is going to be creating the Azure App Service. This is where our web API is going to be located. This is not publishing my web API. This is only creating the Azure App Service that will host my web API. All right, so this was created. Our Azure App Service was created, so I can click on Next. I skip this step, Finish. And now we have our published profile ready. So we can go down here to Service Dependencies and we have Azure API Management. I can ignore for all profiles, but I need to configure the SQL Server database. So let's say connect. I will use a Azure SQL database, create new. I will go to database server and create a new server. You can choose whatever location is closer to you. In my case, East US is fine. Username, I will just put Gavilanche. And for a password, I will use a super secret password. Now I need you to keep this information at hand because we are going to use it in just a minute. So let me click on OK and let me also create a database. So create. This may take a few minutes, so please be patient. Now let's click on the database that we want to use and let's go to next. As I mentioned before, I needed the information that we have on our app settings. So let me copy this and paste that here. The name of the username is Gavilanche, as you saw, and also the password is my super secret password. I will save the connection string in the Azure app settings. Next. Now in here, please uncheck this and keep this one checked. And now finish. The second one that we kept checked will allow us to apply the migrations automatically into our Azure SQL database. So let's do that. Let me come here and let me wait for this to load. Remember that at the beginning of this video, I told you that it was mandatory to install the Entity Framework Core CLI tool. So this is why it is mandatory because this step requires the Entity Framework Core CLI tool. Now, something that may happen to you, as it is happening to me, is that I have the application running. So that is why this may not load. So let me cancel and let me do it again. And it is done. So let me come here and let me say apply this migration and publish. Save. And we are ready to publish. So let me click on publish. And this is going to publish our web API. It is going to also apply the migrations into our Azure SQL database and we'll be able to use our application in Azure. Now we're going to get here a 404 because we have to go to Swagger. So let's go back to here. I need to activate Swagger on production. So for that, I can go to the program class. I can just remove this code. And now Swagger is going to be on production. So let me publish one more time. And again, we're here. Now let me say slash swagger. And we have swagger in production. So I can, for example, create a new genre. Let me say action, execute. And we have a 200 OK. And if we go back to get, now we can see that we have indeed science fiction, animation, and action. Because remember that these were part of a migration. All right, so if you want to learn more about Entity Framework Core, please buy my Udemy course today, where you will learn much more about this technology. Link with a discount in the description of this video. Thank you.